Welcome back from the break. My name is Matt Teets. I'm a regional sales manager with Rab Lighting, and I get the privilege of uh, moderating the industry expert panel today. We have some really great panelists with uh, many years of experience in the industry. So what I need from you guys all out there is to start thinking of questions that you might want to ask them to tap into their experience. They're going to all start with a little uh, two-minute intro about themselves, how they got to where they are. And uh, if you want more information about each one of them, it is on the app. Who has the app? Let's see a show of hands. OK, yeah, if you drill down into the app, it's a beautiful headshot of each one of you guys and the bios that you sent us prior. So uh, we're going to kick things off and be ready with some questions. We'll start with Pam. Just tell us a little about how you got where you are today. OK, so um, I would not be much of a repeatable story. I started out at a water well drilling company as the soil secretary. I know that sounds pretty exciting. Um, about a, a year later, I was promoted to water supply secretary, and I was so proud. <laughs> it was a big moment for me. Um, so I spent 10 years there. I went in then to the aerospace industry. I spent about 15 years in aerospace. Um, the thing I would say about aerospace is they think what, what someone in aerospace would say, it's a very relationship-driven type um, community, but they have nothing on the electrical industry. I can tell you that for sure. After I left aerospace, I took a job in the electrical industry. This was about 2006 with Millbank Manufacturing as the director of marketing. So I spent um, my early years doing, uh, having titles in engineering, sales, business development, and marketing. But I started out as a director of marketing at Millbank. Spent about four and a half years there. I'm actually, I live just south and east of Kansas City, and Millbank is a manufacturer based in Kansas City. Many of you probably know Millbank. So I'm, um, unfortunately, I can't go anywhere without looking at the meter sockets on the side of the building, even though I still don't work there. I still wander over and check it out. Um, so after Millbank, I left Kansas City, moved to Philadelphia uh, as VP of Marketing for Affiliated Distributors. So I had lived my whole life in Kansas City and then you know, moved to Philadelphia, not much like the Midwest, but uh, a great experience and something that um, really framed my point of reference when it concerns the industry I learned a lot about. The distributor side of the business, I knew manufacturing pretty well, and I learned a ton about buying groups. So I worked at AD for about four and a half years. My husband's kids were um, still in high school, so we commuted on the weekends for about four and a half years, which as you can imagine how exciting that could be um, on American Airlines. But uh, after that, I went to work for NSI Industries, which is a manufacturer based just north of Charlotte. And then I had the opportunity to uh, work for a good friend of mine, Karen Klaus. And really, when I decided jobs, um, one of the things that was my driving factor was um, my boss has a lot to do with my happiness factor. And so I picked someone that I wanted to work for and with, and that is Karen Klaus, and that is uh, my role at Shattershield. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Jason. I'm I'm Jason Hill. Um, I started in the electrical industry because I decided to be an electrical engineer through school. Um, I ask a lot of people that I interview, I'm like, how did you pick your degree and how, why did you this? Because I like to share why I pick why I'm an electrical engineer. It's 17 years old when you're picking which school you want to go to. My dad gave me the starting salaries of every degree because he did not want a professional student as a son. And electrical engineering was first. So I am an, an electrical engineer. I'm in the electrical industry simply because at that point in time in 1991, it was the highest starting salary. After that, I worked for Siemens. I was an application engineer, grew up through manufacturing, engineering, quality control. And then I, um, I basically did a shift. I was in a very customized gear environment and wanted to see if I could actually sell, which is probably very unusual for an engineer. I went to work for Legrand. Legrand gave me a very commodity-based background and led us into to data communications. So I started with Hellerman Titan in 2000. So in about a month, we'll be 18 years with Hellerman Titan, which is pretty rare. Very few people probably do that now. But I started in data communications. They let me grow through it. 
Um, they let me expand and have different roles. I ran their data center group for a couple years. So I went data communications and I went to the data center. So all the cloud stuff, all the fun stuff you'd see, we were pretty heavily involved in that. And for the last six years, I've been leading their electrical group. Um, so we started as a market development, then we build a team and we continue to build a team today. And I would say Pam and I from the giving back side, we're both on the manufacturers council. Um, this year I happen to be the chair, so we're trying to do things to actually change the industry going forward. Thank you. Let's move on to Greg. Sure. Uh, Greg Lampert, uh, I was a uh, chemical engineer for much the same reasons as Jason, other than electrical was too hard for me, so I went chemical. <laughs> and uh, so chemical engineer, co-op with Dow Chemical, spent my first eight years after I graduated from uh, school, I went on the business side. So I bagged kind of the, the technical side and, uh, and went on the business side. Spent eight years with Dow, uh, earned an MBA in Chicago, and uh, so gained some more business skills. And then uh, I usually don't mention, it's not in my bio, but I went to work for a year for Cintas, uh, a company. Uh, uh, I wanted to get back to Cincinnati. My early years, I moved seven times in five years. I was moving all over, and my wife finally uh, we had our first son. She did a big circle around uh, where she grew up and said, it'd be nice if you could find a job in that circle. So uh, so I went to Cintas for a year. But it's interesting. The reason I bring it up is, uh, you know, when you think about, you know, having success or failing, you know, I, I thought it was a great opportunity, great company. It is a great company, great people. It was funny. When I got there for a year, I figured out, you know what, this isn't the match for me. So, you know, kind of one of those life lessons of fail fast and move on. And I said, you know, it's... I need to get back into uh, manufacturing, industrial manufacturing. So I found General Cable. General Cable is based in Cincinnati. Spent 18 years with General Cable. Did a little bit of everything. Uh, started as a product manager, uh, managed businesses, managed sales. Eventually, I became uh, CEO of the North American region. Probably three years later, I added Latin America. So I started traveling around Latin America. I know zero Spanish, a lot of German, didn't help me at all in Latin America. Um, so uh, I had a great experience uh, at the end, managed uh, all public companies, managed about three billion in sales, about uh, 7,500 people. And then, uh, and then I joined the club. You guys aren't in the club, the club is the 50 club. So I turned 50 and I said, I wanna do something a little different. And uh, so I'm with Omni Cable now, I've been with Omni Cable about a year and a half. Went from big public companies to the private sector. Went from manufacturing to distribution. But I will say this, I wanted to stay in the industry. When I left General Cable, I loved the electrical industry and uh, wanted to stay in the industry. So now I'm part of an ESOP company, much smaller company, having a lot of fun. It's a very different public company, private company. They're both good, but they uh, have different things. And uh, it's really neat being part of, uh, and there's a lot of uh, people in here that are part of ESOP companies. We're an ESOP company. And I will say it's really neat when you uh, come from a public company where you do a lot of things that either are good for the shareholder or good for the employee. And what's fantastic being a part of an ESOP is when you do something good, it's good for the owner and it's good for the employee. So it's uh, you know really gratifying. Thanks, Greg. We'll move on to Melissa. Hello, I'm Melissa Lunick. Um, my background, I would say, is quite diverse. Um, I have an education in communication disorder, so I'm not quite sure why I'm on the panel, but in communicating, um, I started at an electric cooperative, actually. I got a job as the receptionist. My father um, said to me that day when I came home, and I said, I started at an electric distribution. I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I was going to get married, and I wanted a job until I went on to grad school. Um, my father said to me, well, you know what? I work at a G&T. We provide the power to that distribution. I ended up staying there for 15 years, actually. Um, I was a receptionist, and then I went into customer service, and then I asked a lot of whys. I remember I would go back to the engineering manager at that time and say, but why? Why do we do it this way? Why do, how? How do we read a map book? How do we do, how do we um, tap into a power line? So with that being said, it took me from the job I had in customer service to go back to the engineering department as an assistant. It was great. I learned a lot. Um, I then uh, became over, head over the um, metering department and then the dispatch. So from there, um, my husband's career was taking a, a turn and we needed to leave um, the city for him to have an opportunity in a different city. And then I ended up um, leaving the company of 15 years and I ended up um, as a co-op, you wear many hats. A, a hat I wore there also 
was HR. So needless to say, I, I put in an application for an HR director at a school district in the town that we moved to. And I would say they took a risk on me because I did not, and it's not my background, but certainly um, they hired me. So I was in a school district for three years. Needless to say, I got a phone call from the president of Dakota Supply Group and said, once who I purchased from, and said, we heard you went down the HR track. And that was, yes, I did. Um, we are looking for the head of our HR department. We want to talk to you. And so here I am today. I've been at Dakota Supply Group for almost five years, um, overseeing the HR department. I love it. I will tell you that I did not pick this career. This career picked me. And I can't be um, more content in this company in the fact of I get to look in each and every one of our associates every day. And I consider it a big circle, honestly. Um, I look at it from the perspective like I knew electrical distribution, but not wholesale distribution. So still learning a lot on that front of it, but certainly something that I look forward to into the future. Thank you very much. I'm gonna kind of lay out a few ground rules for you guys. If you do have a question, um, just put your hand up and we have two mic runners. We have Paul and we've got Eric. They got microphones, so let them know you want the mic. Uh, if you do have a question, stand up, uh, let us know who you are, who you work for, and if you want to direct your question to any specific uh, panelist, let us know that as well. We're going to try to get as many questions answered as we can, so uh, each panelist may not necessarily answer uh, your questions. So if you have a specific person that you want to answer it, let us know that. So I'll kick things off with a question for Greg. And uh, the question is, uh, what challenges? So the theme this morning was basically these very inspirational parents that, that have uh, influenced these uh, wonderful speakers. What challenges have you faced in your career? And um, how, is, how have you overcome that to get to where you are? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, you hear some of these stories and, and you're in awe, right? And, and so I, I've never had, you know, kind of the, uh, the difficult situations that, that some of the speakers bring up or some that you hear uh, you know, throughout your career. But I will say in, in my career, so my first, so I was with General Cable for 18 years. Um, the first two years I was there, we had a really, really difficult CEO, meaning very smart, very sharp, um, but very, very challenging, meaning challenging, in your face challenging, you know, really would embarrass people in, uh, in a room. And, and I, it was interesting, I, I told you how I, how I got there because I wanted to get back to Cincinnati and I wanted a company in the industrial space. But I used to sit at my desk at times saying, if he comes in and challenges me, I am gonna let him have it. I'm gonna let him have it and I'm gonna head out of here. And, um, but I learned a lot. Um, I learned, uh, one, to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, make sure to, you know, stick the course, because I really thought it was a great company. I thought I could have a great career there. Uh, and a lot of people, frankly, got, uh, got chased out of the company because they just didn't like that style. You know, it's interesting to hear Pam say, you know, she went to work for a person that, uh, that she really wanted to work for. I always tell people be cautious of that, because that can change like that. So go to work for, you know, a person you want to work for, but go to work for a company and go to work for a place you really want to be beyond just one person. And uh, so I would say surviving him when lots of people didn't, um, you know, allowed me to have a, a great 18-year career there. So, uh, but it was tough times. I, I had my resume out. I looked around a lot and uh, decided it was better to stick it out. Stay the course. That's good. Do we have any, uh, anyone with a question? We got one right over here. I'm Andrew Tate with uh, Millbank, and um, I just want to ask the panel. Hey, Pam. <laughs> I just want to ask the uh, panel about uh, mentors you've had in the industry, and um, kind of to just talk about them in general, and and how you identified them, and how you worked with them. Should we start with Pam? Uh, I'd love that question. Um, so my one of my first mentors in the electrical industry was Bruce Bittner, who I worked for at Millbank. He hired me at Millbank. And the thing about Bruce is he would come to me and he would say, Pam, I have this project I want you to work on. And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, don't know how to do it, never done it, no, 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 no. In my mind, I'm saying, no, no, no. But he always believed in me way more than I believed in myself. And he would push me to the edge of the cliff but you know, I, I always knew that I could, could count on him to help me through it. And so he pushed me to do 
uh, projects and get in front of people. I think when I started at Millbank, I did more presentations to like the board and executive teams um, in my first six months there than I'd done my entire career. Because he's like, you need to do this. This is what you need to do. You can do this. I believe in you. And when the speaker earlier said those words, I believe in you, I remembered Bruce Bittner because he didn't always say those words, but the his choice and the way he set up my career goals and the way he made me believe, you know, I thought a director of marketing was like my foremost goal. That was the top I was ever going to be. And, but he sort of opened my eyes to, you know, Pam, it's a bigger world, and I know what you're capable of, and I see your potential. And so that mentorship um, helped me through the process and really um, spurred my career and, and helped me have that belief in myself that Ben talked about earlier. So to expand on that, do any of your companies have a formal mentoring program, and how does, how does that set up? No? I think we just struck out. Oh, I know. No, we no. don't. No, we don't. I would just say I would advocate, but we don't. So as Jason. far as looking at that, you know, I just to say what Pam said, too, it's just having that person that believes in you and no, no question is a dumb question and having the patience to, you know, go to that person and say, you know what, I don't know. And that that to be OK. We need that. We need that more because I think that's going to only help and propel and keep those people that want to be challenged and want to have that patience and that guidance. So certainly right now we don't, but really looking to advocate to fill that void. Yeah, I would say this too, Matt. Um, you know, formal mentoring programs can be very good, but you got to be really careful because, you know, to Pam's point, you, you choose your own mentor. It is really not something that can be forced. And even if you say, hey, we have this group who we think would be really good members, if the chemistry is not right, if the relationship's not right, it just doesn't work. So I, I think... Uh, you know, companies that encourage mentorship without kind of formalizing mm -hmm. it probably, you know, get more success out of it. Great point. I would say that from what I've seen in my career, early on I would say it was my bosses that were my great mentors. And I would say in the past, I don't know, five or six years as the roles progressed up, I've seen that the change in the mentorship. I would say probably today I have more mentors than I've ever had. And it's the, the leaders of the industry that can really have the hard conversations with you. So I would, I would very much encourage to reach out. What I found is no one typically will say no. Everyone will help you. Um, and they'll probably give you the tough answers that someone within your company probably wouldn't do. Fantastic.